Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Shaw, for the introduction. And uh, like you said, I'm from Meriden, Kansas, and I know a little bit about Hudson's. And uh, we have here a, a nice 51 convertible that's, that's fixed up very nice. It's a beautiful car. They're very roadable cars and very, a very comfortable ride. And so if you ever get a chance to, to hop in one and take a ride and a drive, please do, because you'll enjoy it. We started with uh, Hudson's in about 1985 uh, at the, at the uh, uh, request of my son who wanted a car with a pointed front end, so he bought a 38 Hudson. And uh, that turned into a, to a 54 Hudson Hollywood, two-door hardtop. And then I bought a Hudson Jet and then a 50 Hudson Super 6 sedan, and we've kind of went from there. And my daughter, who's standing here, sitting here, Jennifer McCall, she and her husband also play with Hudson's and they've got a 46 coupe and a 47 sedan and a 49 coupe and so they've got Hudson's too. My son has like I say a 38 and a, a sedan, eight cylinder sedan and a, and a 54 two door hardtop and I've got the jet that's parked outside that I drove up here as well as my 50 and some other ones. We've got lots of parts and pieces and, and projects and things to do with Hudson's. Okay, Hudson started out in 1909 by some engineers that had worked for Thomas Flyer, and and uh, they were involved in in the the race cars that they had, and they wanted to build a dependable car for the average person to to, to enjoy. So they got together with a man by the name of Hudson, who had department stores, and started the Hudson Car Company, and the the Hudson company was, was, was funded by Mr. Hudson and so he got to put his name on the logo. So, but they, uh, uh, Hudson was, was early into the business and they were, they, they were very innovative in that they were, were um, one of the first companies to go to a balanced crankshaft. They were one of the first companies to go to an all steel body. They were one of the first companies right behind Chrysler, excuse me, <clears throat> right behind Chrysler to uh, go with hydraulic brakes. They, had, they were big into safety and handling and, 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 and trying to make a car that ran good and performed well. And so they developed a thing called fail-safe brakes, which when your master cylinder goes bad, it puts the emergency brake on. Yay, you, you, it, it slows down the crash. And <laughs> it's not, it's not, it turns it in from a high-speed crash into a low-speed crash. It's, it's, it's hardly wonderful, but it's better than crashing. And, um, but they were trying, they, had, they, they were innovative. They were really uh, one of the first companies to go to uh, tubular shocks, airplane type shocks, rather than the lever arm shocks. Um, they uh, had some odd things that they did that worked real well. Uh, one like the cork clutches that they use that, are, that run in oil. Um, they work really well, but it's kind of an odd setup and, and they're kind of a pain to change, but uh, um, <clears throat> they, uh, they work well. And, uh, so uh, Hudson started out, like I say, in 1909. Uh, they d wanted a second line of cars, so they developed the Essex, and the Essex was their secondary line. The Ex Essex turned into the Terraplane, which was their second line. Um, they, were, they built uh, six cylinders and eight cylinders, all straight inline engines, L-head with uh, splash oil, and, in, and then after World War, during World War II, they built uh, parts for for the defense industry and landing craft engines that were an invader landing craft engine and then they they um, after World War II they they retooled and redesigned in 48 and started out with this style car here which were unibody which was one of the first companies in the United States to go unibody worked out really well for them and they built designed this engine which was their first pressure oil engines up to then they'd use splash oil and these engines are tough. I think they looked over the fence at, Chry at Chrysler and they said, let's just make it a third heavier than Chrysler and make it a third bigger than Chrysler. And that's what, what we have here. The, the sim design on, on Hudson, Hudson 6s are very, is very similar to a Chrysler engine. And they, they, the Chrysler engines were good engines and these are excellent. Hudson always in their engine products used a nickel steel cast iron which if you've ever machined any of it, you'll find out that it's, it's probably as good a cast iron as any engine in the country. It, it's really nice to machine. It, it doesn't have as much free carbon in it and it's harder. Um, 
Let's see, anything else I need to tell you? That's kind of the short form of it, and I don't know how much detail you wanted. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to take questions, uh, but uh, you know, I don't know how detailed to get and what, what you would want to know. So let's just go, anybody got any questions? Yes? You use the term splash oil, and I'm probably the only person <coughs> in here that doesn't know what that is. Okay. Um, some, some of the engines before they had pressure oil used a dipper and a dip pan and the rods dipped into a dip pan of oil that was in the crankcase and it splashed the oil up and it lubricated the camshaft and, all, and the main bearings by the oil that ran back down, ran into troughs and ran into trays that went into the main bearings and that's the way they lubricated them before, before pressure oil. Now we, we took four Hudson splash oil eights and made them pressure oil eights which was a lot of work and, and for, I'm not sure, all that much benefit, but we did it anyway. We wanted to see if we could, and we did, and uh, it was a, was a time-consuming and frustrating deal that we got it done. But, but we got, we got, we got three, two of them in cars running now and a couple of them hanging on engine stands still. But anyway, yeah, that's what splash oil is, yes? This is a 51. Uh-huh. When did they stop production? Okay. The, the last Hudson Hudson was in 1954. And they merged with Nash to make American Motors, and they built them to 57. But they, after 54, they were Nash bodies and parts and pieces of Hudson, and some of them, she, my daughter Jennifer has a, a, a 56 that has a Packard motor and transmission in it that was, then they put Packard, bought Packard motors and put in them. Uh, so they'd have a V8. They wanted a V8, and so that's um, that's when they when they cease production. And and the the jet that I've got out there, they built those in 1953 and 1954. And they built about 25,000 of them each year. And when they merged with Nash, Nash had the little Nash Rambler, beep beep, beep beep, that guy. So they didn't need the Hudson jet, so it went away. And to my way of thinking, the Jet's a better car than the Nash Rambler, but it was, it's a whole lot more solid, solidly built. But um, the Nash Rambler prevailed, and, and Hudson went away, and, uh, that's, that's, but that's when they started, from 09 to 54, and then, then, then again as American Motors till 57. Yes, sir? Why were these beating the uh, Ford V8? <laughs> <laughs> when NASCAR started. Tell us about that. Okay, the reason that those won in NASCAR was when they, they wanted to race them and they, they built what they called a 7X high, high performance motor and police interceptor high, high hard service motor. And, and they put two inch intake, the, the, the standard ones have two and seven eighths intake valves. I mean one and seven eighths intake. And the, 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 the police, the seven X motors had two inch intake valves. They had a split manifold, they had a different camshaft. Um, they had uh, a higher compression head and, and they, they did a little tweaking at the factory. And, uh, and that was, they, they, were, they were supposed to be 150 horsepower and they were probably closer to 200. And, uh, but they, the Oldsmobiles and, 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 and all had, had valves in them about as big as your shirt button. And real choke ports in the same way with the Oldsmobiles. In 54, Oldsmobile redesigned their head. And, and, and opened up the valves and the ports on them a little bit. And, and that's when Hudson started losing ground was to, to Oldsmobile and, and uh, Chrysler was coming out with the Hemi. And that was, that was what was their nemesis and why they kind of started. Uh, they didn't win as much in, the, in 54 and, and 5. Well, these had an awfully low center of gravity too, so they would corner better. Yes, they're, they're unibody cars. The, the, the center of gravity is low. The uh, engine sits way down in it and way back and they, they corner it. And another reason is that they developed their torque real low. And in those days they were racing a lot of it on dirt and a lot of it like Daytona was part on, on asphalt and part in the sand. And these things don't have to have to rev up to pull. They, they get their RPM at a, they get their torque at about 1800 RPM. And uh, so they're, 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 they'll, they'll dig where the others have to rev up to get any power and so these are pulling all, all the way. And that's why they were good. Any other questions? Everybody seems to want to know what the horsepower is from the, the nuts and bolts of it. Just wasn't the torque. Yeah, and, and at what position do you get it? Where, where is it? Where do you develop the torque at? These have a real heavy crankshaft in them and real heavy rods in them. 
so they don't come up quick. So they have to they have to have their torque low because they're not a, they're not designed to rev. They're a, they're a you know five under five thousand RPM motor. Yes, sir. They were rather revolutionary in their design of the interior. It's known as a step down mm -hmm. into a bathtub sort of sort of yeah, comfort feeling, as well as the dash. The dash had a driver's uh, glove box and a passenger glove box with the speedometer in the center. Only in 48.9. Oh. Uh-huh. Did, did they want to come out as a different option and something to attract people? Well, um, I'll, they, they had a lot of, did a lot of export business. And a lot of the country, com, uh, countries have, have the steering wheel on the opposite side. So the idea of that was all you had to do was put the steering box on the other side and, and, sw and swap the pedals and stuff around. And you could, you could change them from one side to the other. And the, the speedometer and all was still in the center. And that's why they did it uh, in 48 and 9 was for export business. They, in, um, before World War II, they exported a lot of, of chassis to Britain. And the British coach builders wouldn't let them send a finished car in because it was inter interfering with their, their work. So they, they, would, they would build a chassis called a Railton, I mean a, a body called a Railton body and put them on a Hudson chassis. So if you see anything that says Railton, that's a Hudson chassis with, a, with an English built body. But yeah, they, they did a lot of, there's a lot of these cars in, in uh, Australia, uh, especially pre-war cars and in, in South Africa. And, and, and if quite a few of them in Europe. Sweden also drove on the wrong side of the road. Yeah. Uh -huh. Until 1967 or 68. Yeah, and that, that was why they made, they, they made a lot of their cars so that they, could, that they could change them from one side to the other. Any more questions? How often did you need to replace the fluid and the clutch? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I, th I think I think that you changed your clutch fluid at every 15,000 miles, if I remember right. I can't, I don't have the service in front of me, but yeah, I think it's 15,000 miles. How often did it get done? Huh? How often did it get done? Uh, probably not very often, because it's kind of a pain in the ass. When the, when the clutch fails? Yeah, it, it, that's when they got, got serviced or checked. But uh, the, um, on the flywheel, there's two little stars, and there's, two, there's a plug. And you take the plug out up here on the engine, in the engine compartment, and you turn it down to where a star comes up in the in the in the in the opening on the the, the uh, bell housing. And when the star comes up, that means that the plug's down, and that drains the oil out. Then you turn it back around to where the plug's at, and you you stick some kind of a funnel with a tube on it down in there, and pour your six ounces of clutch fluid in, and screw the plug back in. <laughs> and that was the way that they had it set to do. And I told somebody that on, online here the other day, and they said, oh, but that makes a big mess. But back in those days, they didn't care. You know, <laughs> everything leaked. <laughs> Where do you buy Hudson Hyde oil today? The Hudson Club has a club store, and we get it from them and buy it in, in little six ounce bottles. And it's black as black paint? No, what they sell is, is pretty clear. Yeah, it's pretty clear. Well, I've, we've had some that were purple and some that's black and some that's clear. And the purple stuff that we got was from, from uh, uh, Doug Hudson out of, out of Florida. And we put that in some clutches and, and they, they had too much uh, lubrosity to it and they wouldn't hold. So we had to drain them back out and put, put the other stuff in. But the best we've found is what the club store has. I changed the clutch on a 47 four-door one time. And you have to take the front seat out, take the floorboard out because it has to come out the top. And I don't remember, the, the guy that owned it had the Hudsonite oil. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, the throw-out bearing, it's got a seal, on seal it. around it, and it was a royal pain in the neck because the, the, uh, the bell housing is cast iron with the transmission, so you got the whole works going in there at one time. Well, if you remember when we, I was speaking earlier, I alluded to the fact that changing the clutch was a pain in the ass, <laughs> and you're exactly right. <laughs> The, the, they never the cross members on them don't on the on the manual transmissions don't come out so you got to take the transmission through the top or take the whole power unit out to change the clutch and it's about as easy to take the whole power unit out as it is to take them up through especially if it has overdrive on it because the overdrive transmission is about that much longer and the opening in the floor pan makes it to where you can't tip the transmission and take it up out and they are a real trick to try to do with overdrive on them the next one I do I'm going to take the whole thing in yeah I think that's yeah, well, um, 
uh, where I've got overdrive in mine, I usually just pull the whole drive train, just take the engine out. Because to trying to lay on your belly and, and wrestle 150 pounds of iron that won't come up out of there without standing it on end yep. is really a trick. Now, the, man, the, the straight three-speed manuals, I think you could probably, they're a little better because they're lighter and they're shorter. This one had the overdrive. Yeah, and overdrive is, it makes them double, a double problem. Some people just sh just shove them back and wedge them in there, and then try to work up in the space. That's that's a th th but uh, that's pretty tight to try to do. Yeah. Any other questions? How many Hudson convertibles have been there? Oh, I don't know. Uh, you'd have it's in the book, and, I, and you'd have to look it up. But I don't I don't have it in my head. There were about five hundred, I think, in fifty one. Yeah, something like that. There were the, the the convertibles are the most desirable and 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 bring the most money. Uh, followed by the coupes and the and the Hollywoods, and then the four door sedans. Nah, eh, they're not so much. But uh, but the, the 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 convertibles are very sought after. The uh, coupes are sought after, and the Hollywoods are, are sought after, and uh, carry pretty good value. And where were they made? Uh, Detroit. What's the most collectible? An Italia. Yeah. And they only built just a very few of them. And they're, they're uh, an Italian body with a jet engine in them. And they're very nice. And I wish they would have made those instead of the jet and, 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 put, and put a bigger motor in them. And they would have been fun. But they didn't. And it's, but anyway, yeah, but the Italia is the most collectible, probably. Is there a weak link to the design, a weak link in any place? Oh, everything has a weak link. I know we had a carrier bearing in the very center that was vibrating at a certain speed. Um, those generally don't cause a whole lot of trouble. They're, they're sitting on a rubber snubber, which is just a motor. It, you can buy those at, at Granger's. They're just a motor uh, uh, suppressor rub, s s mount thing. And, and uh, they're, they're, but we don't have much trouble with carrier bearings. But I have twisted the center out of several of their clutches because uh, I have a, had a 308, the one I just pulled out that had it was cammed up a little bit, and and it had a little more than it should have. And, and the, the input shaft and the clutches are, are not terribly. They, they designed that clutch back in the 30s, and they never increased the size of the input shaft or, or the, the way that the, the torsional springs were cut into the clutch disc, and, and they were a little weak. You could, you could twist off input shafts or twist the center out of the clutch pretty easy. That's a wink leak. It's hard to believe that those little cork would hold that tight. Well, you know that you know it looks it looks and it and would last, you know. And but you think about your automatic transmission; they're they're, they're just a, a a little bit of a fiber running running in oil, and they last for hundreds of thousands of miles. No, the clutches were really as far as wearing out and holding; they did real well. But the the weak part of them is is where the torsional dampening springs are cut into the center plate. So that they can they can slip, they're cut so far in that it's there's not much metal there, and they it snaps those off. And I've I've twi there's several different I've got two or three different kinds of, of clutch designs, and and there's some of them that are better than others. The ones with the great big torsional springs are weak. If I remember right, those little corks were about the size of a nickel. Uh, they're about five eighths of an inch. The hole the hole in the plate I think is half inch, and the cork itself is about five eighths. And you heat them, you heat them up in, 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 in water, hot water, and then you can pop them right in. I've recorked several of them and turned them, but there's a, there's a guy by the name of Doug Fellows and, and Doug Wilrick, uh, yeah, Ron Fellows and, and, and Doug Wilrick both do clutches, and they're about $150 a piece. But uh, any other questions? Did you say you drove that one from Mary? No, no, I drove, I got, I was pointing out that way. I, I got a, I drove a Hudson Jet. From Meriden, that old ugly jet out there. And did you stay under the speed limit? Uh, well, this, that's a the speedometer is a little bit wacky in that car because it it uh, it, it doesn't tell you anything. And and uh, and most of the way down, I was running about 90, <laughs> but I was running with the traffic at about 65. Yeah, it, they'll they'll run up with the traffic. Yeah, the ones like this, they'll their their maximum speeds right around 110 uh, in stock form. They'll run about 110. Any other questions? I, I run mine, the one I've been driving for years, the 50 I've got, has got a hydromatic rear end, the same rear end that's in this car. It's a, two, it's a 358 to one rear end in it. 
and then I've got overdrive on top of it, and then a cammed up 308. And I, I, I run with the big dogs out on the turnpike with that. It'll, it'll, get, it'll go fast enough to get you a ticket. Oh, yeah. And, uh, but anyway, questions on the back row back there? I might have missed this, but uh, when they merged with NASH, they were forced to because, or why did they end up merging? Hudson was broke, <laughs> and uh, they, 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 they weren't profitable, and they had had a couple of bad years. They spent a lot of money developing the jet, and the jet was kind of a fallacy and didn't sell, and so they were in financial trouble, and, and, and they were looking for some place to go, and they merged with, with Nash in 54. Jen. What's the best beginner Hudson for somebody who wants to get started with the hobby? The one that you can find that looks halfway decent and isn't, and most of the pieces are there, and doesn't cost you a fortune, and uh, and one that you like, that, me, that meets your, you know, some some people like the older, you know, the iron cars than and back in the teens and twenties, that's that's good, but it, that's never been a, something that appealed to me because they're not rotable, and uh, uh, I like the step downs. They're they're they're. They're my favorite, and uh, they're they're very rotable and very easy to drive, and uh, I, I I enjoy mine, and and that's why I like and and I like four door sedans dis, despite what everybody else says because they're utilitarian. You can throw them throw the groceries in, and and throw the kids in the back seat, and you can take off and go and have fun, and it's easy to get stuff in and out of them, and they're they're just a, a, a fun thing to play with, uh, whereas. I don't like the coupes because the back seat is scrunched up to make the trunk long, and there's the back seat's not usable. Yeah, the, and and it's, uh, and it's hard to get in and out of them, and so they're they're kind of a limited use thing. The Hollywoods are kind of a compromise between it, uh, and they're much better. They've got a better back seat in them, and I like the Hollywoods uh, because they're a nice looking car. But it, as far as what you want to want to get into. Um, it's what appeals to you and what you can afford and, and try to buy one that's not terribly rusty. These are unibody and if the unibody's eight clear up, that's a lot of work to try to repair them. But if you can find one that isn't, you know, that's solid, up until 54, the back fenders unbolt off of them. The rocker panels unbolt off of them and you can get right into anything you need to to, to repair it and they're really there's a lot of pieces, but they're not that hard to do, and, and they're, they're forgiving because you can take the panels off and get in and, and do your stuff and put them back together. Whereas the 54s are spot welded together, and they're a little harder because you've got to cut the spot wells out if you need some. Jim, is a 54 or the Hollywood, is that a hard top? Uh, yeah, a Hollywood is a two-door hard top. Okay. Yeah, and uh, I should have, I, I, I'm sorry for not making that clear. I, I'm thinking, you know, we, we know Hudson's, but. <laughs> One thing I learned about Hudson's at the Hostetler Museum in Shipshawana is Hudson would would sell you a car in any color that was available in automotive paint, mm -hmm. clear back into the teens. So a lot of Hudson's were very colorful cars, but most other cars were black or dark green or gray. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they, but, the, but the interior until 1953 came in two colors. <laughs> and it looked like a bad business suit <laughs> or a drapery. <laughs> they, they were, they, they, yeah. You could have have a gray with 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 a a, a, a blue and a green stripe, or usually, and then, or you could have kind of a tan with a red and yellow stripe in it. And that was kind of their their color combinations for interiors. And then in 53, they, like everybody, in, it was about 53, changed to color keyed interiors, which was, it was good. You know, made it a whole lot, they're a prettier car. But, um, and Hudson used the wood grain dashes clear up until the, that same period of time. And um, they were, it was kind of interesting how they made those. They, 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 they uh, 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 printed, the, 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 the dash with a, on a flat panel and then they bent it after the wood grading was already on. Yeah, and, and I don't know how they kept them from, t from, the, the f from, from breaking or pulling, but they did, and it, it, but they printed them before they, before they pressed them. It'd be easier to do that way. Hmm? It would be easier to do that way. Yeah, to print, because they, they photo printed them on there and litho, litho printed them on there and then, then they bent them 
but I would have thought that the dyes would have would have torn up their litho printing, but I guess they knew how to do it. So, models. What um, what different models did they have? I've got some more. Okay, in in fifty in fifty one they would have had um, a pacemaker, a, and you could have a Commodore six or a Commodore eight, and then you could have a Hornet. So is the Hornet the low end or high end? The Hornet is the, is the big car with the big motor in it. The Hornet, what makes them a Hornet is they put a 308 cubic inch engine in them. The Super 6 has a 262 cubic inch engine. It's the same engine, just a different bore and stroke. Um, the, the Commodore 8s were carried over from back in the 30s and they were the splash oil. They were 200 and, 254 cubic inches and 128 horsepower. And like I say, we've got some of them, and I've worked on them. And I'm, I, I, the Hornet motors are, I'm, I'm impressed. And the 262s get about two miles to the gallon better gas mileage and, and perform pretty well. But uh, the, the Hornet, they, they, they run, they, they're the most powerful of the bunch, and they're a beast. Did, did most of the terraplanes use the eight? Uh, most of the terraplanes were, were, the, were, were, the, were the sixes. They were, they were the splash, splash six, the 212s, and, and before that, I think they had a 170-something that they put in some of them. But uh, they did build some, ter some terraplane eights in 34, 33, 34, that were a smaller version of the eight. And they, they were really, they were a small body car, they were light, and they were really known to be fast. Yes? Was the Super 6 a splasher or a pressure? It was a pressure. Well, the, the early, they, they used the name Super 6 for a long time. The early Super 6s were splash motors. And, and the early Super 6s were a great big uh, motor. They were, I can't remember, they were like a five inch board and I can't remember the displacement of them, but they were a whole other motor. And, uh, and they were very dependable in, in all, for the, the day and the time and very powerful. And then the, the later Super 6s, and they were, were the 212 6s, and they, they were, mm, okay. And uh, pretty light. The earlier is what years? Oh, you would have to do that. The, the earlier would have been, uh, in, in the 20s and early 30s, yeah, late 20s, early 30s. And um, the, uh, then, in, then in, the, in the mid 30s, they went to the lighter built S Super 6 motor, which was a three main uh, splash oil, 212 cubic inch motor, and not so impressed with those. The eight cylinder motors were all good. They were a four main motor, five main motor, and they were, they were, uh, were pretty durable, really, for the day and time. They were a good, good enough motor, but they're just not terribly powerful. But uh, did, did, I, did I get all, did I cover it? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. But the later Super 6s, and after 48, were, were 200, 262 cubic inch pressure oil, good motors, bulletproof. That's what we got. Yeah, they were bulletproof. Questions? Anybody? Have I bored you all enough? That's not boring. <laughs> Yes, sir. Kind of a fine point with regard to the dash. Do they have different dash configurations, painted versus burl wood? Um, no. All, all, of, all of them up until 53 had uh, the, the wood grain dashes. There was a couple of different, uh, if, depending on whether you had a Commodore or a Super 6, there was difference, a little difference in those. The Commodore had another piece on it that was a light color as opposed to the dark wood grain that was in the Super 6s. So there was two different configurations between Super 6 and Commodore, but all of them had the wood grain dash until 53. And then they started painting the dashes the color of the interior and using a, 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 a vinyl cover on the dash. But, uh, yes sir? On the, on the twin H engines, those are two barrel carburetors, right? Nope, two ones, two one barrels. So there's not a primary and a secondary? No, they, both the, they were both on. And both of them had chokes. And both of them have chokes accelerator and accelerator pumps, and, and the, the, the exhaust manifold has two heat riser pickups for the, for the choke pull-offs. And um, I always wondered why they didn't put two two barrels on them, but they didn't. And, and they, they, when you go to the, the, the twin H power, you lose about two mile, of, two mile to two or three mile of the gallon on fuel economy, and they, they become a little harder to start in the winter time or if they're hot because of getting the mixture just right to make them either not flood or, but they perform, 
that really the only time you need them is if you got them wound clear up. They, they, they do give you a little more sparkle on the top end. And if you got a cam in them, a little, if they're cammed up, they help a lot on the big end. But for running around going and getting groceries, the two barrel, the, the one two barrel is a better carburetor and get, gets better, better mileage. Any more? Any more questions? Up here, there's some there's some uh, white triangle magazines that are that are the Hudson Club magazines. You can look at those. There's a history of Hudson book up here that you can look at, and you're welcome to to come up and do that. Um, I thank you for your attention and for the questions, and and I hope I didn't uh, cause too much problem or bore you too much into doing it. And that is a nice looking convertible. It is very it, well done. It's it's not. It's not totally correct in, in every detail, but, but it looks really nice. It presents very well. And uh, anybody that owned it would be proud to have it. My friend did a 50 pacemaker convertible. And, and, and all, all of them, most of them had red interiors, leather interiors in them. And he, he had, uh, well, Scarlet ended up, and Topeka ended up finishing it. But, uh, my friend Daryl is very, he, he should be here doing this. He was, he was asked, but he, he, he chickened out. And so that put me in the he position. Put the monkey on your back. Yeah, he put the monkey on my back. And he just had to have open heart surgery here about a, oh, three or four weeks ago. And so he's, he's kind of moving pretty slow right now. But uh, he did a 50, a 50 pacemaker convertible that was par excellent. And, and took it out to Barrett Jackson's and sold it, and it brought a pretty good price. And it and it was a but it was a very good car. And he's a meticulous man, and he's working on a Studebaker right now, and he's also got a, a, a 50 Hudson Commodore that he's he's been working on a little bit. So, um, and he did a 53 Coupe that he sold and went to went to Arizona a number of years ago. And if, if, well, he's done a lot of cars, but very very meticulous man and very detail oriented and, and whoever did this car was was detail oriented it got the panels very straight on that when they painted it it's, it lays really nice there's no no wavies or flaws in it and it's it's a pretty car i like it i'm done thank thank you for your attention thank you for having me